Hi there and welcome to I Inspire on the Red Couch. I Inspire on the Red Couch is about women who we invite to share the story, women who have overcome, women whose stories inspire, women who have developed strength of character through perseverance and tolerance and strength because of what they have been through. So on I Inspire on the Red Couch, on this show, at this time, we're going to have Madge O'Callaghan and she's going to share her story with us. Stay with us. So Madge, it's a pleasure to, to be in your home. We have a lovely home Thank you. here. And um, we're going to be talking to you about your story. We're going to okay. be talking to our audience and sharing your I Inspire story. But before you do that, I just want you to tell us a bit about yourself. Who is Madge O'Connor? Okay, well, um, I'm originally from Cabra West in Dublin and uh, I am the second youngest in a family of ten. We were um, seven girls and three boys born in uh, Cabra West. And um, my mother died when we were all very young. Uh, I was six and my youngest brother, Eddie, was two. I was always reading and um, it was very little privacy in our house, mm. so a lot of my reading took place in the toilet. Mm. It was the only place you could get <laughs> peace. <laughs> and we had a very small house, mm. were, and that was the way it was back then. Yeah. One of the things that I found interesting when I started talking to your daughter, Neve, yes. was the fact that you know there was very little, and you didn't get the kind of education mm. that you wanted at that time. Is that right? Well, you see, there were two things going on. One was that uh, we lived in a very working class area where girls weren't actually, uh, it, it wasn't recognised that girls needed education. Um, and the second thing was that there wasn't enough money. There mm. was no money. But we were very lucky in lots of ways. My father was quite different. Um, he had a, a job as an administrator in the Ordnance Survey. Whereas a lot of the men around us would have had would have been dockers or factory workers or may have been unemployed. Um, so he had this notion that education was the key to everything. Mm. Except we didn't have the money to yes, pay for the yes, key. Yes, <laughs> the key to open. So, uh, but we in uh, the seventies or the, no, the late sixties in Dublin, in Ireland, um, the Minister for Education introduced free secondary education. Mm. So I was very lucky that that came on stream just as I was getting into secondary education. Mm. So I managed to get a leaving cert and um, I was accepted into what was then the College of Commerce in Rathmines uh, and it was the only place in Ireland I think at the time that did journalism. Nice. Uh, but there was no money to send me. And um, there weren't the grants that you could get now. That, that you have now. So yeah. there was the, the lack of funds, but there was also a social attitude. Girls from Cabra West didn't go to college. That was the attitude yes. at the time. So even though I was offered the place uh, in journalism, I wouldn't have been able in myself to go because it wasn't seen as the done thing. You had the dream of being a journalist. I, I did. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted. To, I always wrote. I, you know, I wrote from a very young age, and I was always reading. So I think the two go hand in hand. Yes, yes. And um, I would have written poetry, lots of you know, um, teenage angst poetry, and all of that sort yeah. of stuff. And you, you, you and just wrote. You were telling me about a poetry that you, a poem you just wrote. Yes. Are yes. you going to share that with us? Yes, I will. Yeah. 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 And. Um, but in, as a teenager, I, I uh, loved to write and uh, loved creative writing, yes. literature and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I, I just, when I came to the College of Commerce, I just couldn't take up the place. So I went along and I made some really bad choices, I have to say, in the beginning. You know, I, I uh, got married, I had children, and I was with, um, in a very violent marriage, Very, it was, it was really, um, horrendous marriage and uh, it ended up anyway that I uh, landed in Shannon in County Clare in 1981. I had three children and they were all under six and uh, I was on my own and I had nowhere to live and my brother had a house that he was renting out, a small terraced house and he very kindly 
uh, let me go and stay there. And I went and stayed there for a while. And uh, shortly after that, I was um, given a house by Clare County Council and um, I moved into my first home that I owned myself. And uh, I was so delighted to remember that. It was just a, a weight off my shoulders, you know, to have a place that I could call my own. And the children were getting a little bit bigger at that stage, you know, and um, I was I was working, um, I remember it when I was cleaning toilets in the local pub. I was waitressing in the local pub. Um, I did barmaid and uh, I was, but I got involved in the community and when I moved into this council house. And one day I was there in my house and this man who was a community social worker said to me, um, Madge, you're very articulate. You know, it'd be lovely to see you getting involved in this programme that he was running. And I didn't know what the word articulate meant. And I had to go and look it up. I was maybe 28 at this stage. And I went and I checked out what articulate meant. And I thought, gosh, imagine Kevin Clancy thinks I'm articulate. And it was like, after all the trauma of the marriage and the separation and the, uh, you know, the disruption, for somebody to actually recognise something in me that I thought was well gone was wonderful. It was really, really great. A, a vote of confidence for you. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, to this day, I, I just think, you know, how important it is that we praise people and encourage people to, to um, do things or to be things. Because if it hadn't been for Kevin Clancy that day, I don't think I, I would have got through what I got through. And um, it was just wonderful that he, he took the time to say that to me. And he also did something very clever. He was running this program and he knew that I couldn't pay for the program. And he said, we're running it up in this community centre and we have an old fridge there that needs to be cleaned out. And I was wondering, would you mind cleaning out the fridge for us? And we'll waive the fee for the course. We'll pay you the fee for the course. If you clean out the fridge, was would that be okay? I'm sure I was delighted. I went up with my rubber gloves and my bottle of Jif cleaner, and I got stuck in and I cleaned out the fridge. And that was how I paid for my first course. And it was a course in uh, parenting, and uh, it was wonderful just to be involved in yes. something. Yes. And and that was the beginning of, I suppose, me stepping back into education and um, building my confidence in myself to go forward and so there were lots of skills that I was learning yes. through being involved in community yeah. and one of the things we did was we, we got a group of women together well I say we but it was actually the Sisters of Mercy in Shannon who brought together a group of women and said right what do women really want to hear and lots of ideas came out of this meeting of what was to become SWAG, the Shannon Women's Awareness Group. So SWAG for short. <laughs> and the SWAG, well, swag women, maybe. yes, SWAG loot, yeah. <laughs> the SWAG women um, decided that they would like to learn how to say no mm. and to be assertive and mm. to be able to stand up for themselves. And uh, so a group of us did this assertiveness training. And as a result of that, I decided that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach other people how to say no, how to stand up for themselves, and uh, how to build their confidence and their self-esteem. So um, I got a job then in one of a, a large company in Shannon, and part of their uh, employment uh, deal was that they sent people for training and I trained in HR first of all and then I went and did uh, a diploma in assertiveness and sexuality training. So I began to train other people to um, be it's assertive okay. and what I noticed when I was doing that was I had groups of people and in every single group that I ran 
someone disclosed something about either uh, sexual violence or child abuse or um, uh, some sort of an issue that was preventing them from moving forward. And it always seemed to happen in every group that I had that someone disclosed something. And I thought, you know, I need to do more training to be able to support people when they disclose these things to me. So I went then and trained as a rape and sexual abuse counsellor. Mm -hmm. And from that then I went and trained as a psychotherapist. And um, so I, I did all of these things uh, while still bringing Most up them, my yeah. three children. And working as well. And working. I set up my own counselling and therapy business. And, uh, and I did that for about 12 years and that was, uh, it was really great. So I was, I was facilitating groups, I was training and then I was seeing individuals on a one-to-one -one basis. And, uh, but all the time, all through this, I, I was writing as well and I was, um, I was doing some poetry I was, and I was going to different uh, events, writing events and stuff like that. So the writing never really left me, you know, and the storytelling and all of that sort of stuff that we did as children. Mm. And that writing led you to the award you got in, That's right. in the US. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, what happened was, um, I have, have an uncle who um, had started off his life in an industrial school. Mm. Now, industrial schools in Ireland were terrible places where children were sent when they, if they were orphaned, or if their mothers couldn't manage them. If, a lot of the time I think children with ADD or ADHD were probably sent there because they went undiagnosed. Mm. And when the children went to these um, uh, orphanages, very often they were physically or sexually or emotionally abused. And I knew that this uncle of mine, Jack Dowling, had experienced that. But he had actually gone on to become a, a world record holder in long distance race walking. And I always admired him because he'd, he'd overcome um, this, his early roots. And he, he, he's also a wonderful musician and a singer. And he just has this beautiful presence and I loved him from the time I was a child. I just thought, you know, Jack was just a lovely, lovely man. We all do, we all love him. And um, I read about this uh, documentary making training that was going on in Dublin. At this stage, I was back in Dublin working in mental health. And you, you were about what age at that time? Uh, I was 59 uh, at this stage. <laughs> 60. No, I was actually 60. And um, so I uh, went along to the documentary making weekend. Now, I also have a chronic lung condition. So on the weekend that I went, I wasn't feeling great. And I went to the session in the morning and I had to leave by lunchtime. And I, I often think about it now because when I went along to the training session, I sat in the front row and there was a man beside me who was um, a lecturer in communications at the local colleges. And there was a man the other side of me who well, had made lots of documentaries and they knew each other. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, am I out of my mind sitting here at this thing? These guys, are, they know how to do all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and they're talking to each other across me. But I wasn't well as well, I didn't have a headache. And I left at lunchtime and I went home. And I lay down on the couch at home and just went fast asleep. Woke up the following morning feeling wonderful. I got into the car, went back into the course. I said, right, I'm going to let this be. And I did the second day of the course. And one of the things that they said on the second day was, if you know of someone who's older, who has a story, Go and record the story now, because if they die, you won't be able to record the story. So I said to the producer as I was leaving, I have a story for you. He said, pitch it to me. So we had learned how to pitch a 
that I would make a documentary set and I pitched and I heard nothing and weeks and uh, so I was in hospital for my, my condition and uh, I was checking emails and I saw an email in the same saying you'd like to ring us we like your idea you have talked to us about making this documentary. And I rang, I didn't tell them I was in hospital, I didn't tell them that, you know, what was going on. But I was due to be discharged from hospital on the Friday, mm. and Jack was coming to my home on the Friday. And we were going to celebrate his birthday on the Sunday, he was 86. And uh, so they said, if we sent someone out to your house on Sunday, you start the recording then with all the equipment and we'll show you how to use the equipment as a job. So I had written the story and they arrived out with the equipment out to my house on Saturday when I was living in Wicklow at the time and we had a party in the garden for Jack for his birthday. Lots of my family were there and we started the recording for the documentary. And we made the documentary and Eve was, ex was extremely helpful we needed to interview, in order to make a 40 minute documentary, you do about 40 hours of recording. So we needed to do about 40 hours of recording. And that meant that we needed to interview various members of the family. And we also had to go to the UK to uh, see Jack in his own habitat and interview some of his friends and musician friends. So we did all that. And we came back to our all of these interviews and I was given a mentor in my team who supported me all the way. So he was the senior producer, I was the producer and we worked on this. And at one point I said to Ted, the senior <coughs> producer, do you know what Ted, if, if this doesn't work out, at least I'll have a great bit of family history and I'll be delighted with that. I said, what do you mean if it doesn't work out? You have been commissioned to do this. <laughs> and it was only then I realised the seriousness that I was actually producing a documentary for RTE, RTE. The, the national broadcaster, and I had never produced a documentary for anybody. In your life? In my life. I had I volunteered uh, on radio in Radio Korkoboshkin in Clare. Uh, I did some radio work there. But I'd never held a microphone, I never interviewed myself, anybody for any of these things. So Tim was wonderful, he, he met me very well. And we got the documentary over the line. And it was just lovely to sit back and listen to this documentary once I had done it. So it was a radio documentary obviously, and uh, we got the radio documentary done. And it went out on air in November 2015. Yes, was and uh, I was delighted with myself. That was, I was 61 at that stage. I, I had done my first radio job. Then, about let's say six months later, I got an email from Tim to say that my documentary had been nominated for the New York World Festival of Radio Awards. How did that make you feel? I thought somebody's made a mistake here. <laughs> <laughs> My first thought. And then he sent me an email saying, You've actually been awarded gold in the in the documentary. And I, I was just flummoxed. I really I was over the moon. I couldn't believe it. I thought this is wonderful. Um, this is terrific. Somebody's made a mistake somewhere. <laughs> but I was actually so delighted mm. that my first effort had been had, had, had such an achievement, and we went to New York, and uh, I received this award for the best uh, documentary in its category. And my award was presented to me by um, Susan Sarandon's uh, PA. Susan was supposed to be there herself, but she wasn't able to make it, so she sent her PA. It was beautiful. 
and uh, I was so thrilled by that as well. But the funny thing about it for us as well is that the award, the category that the award was made in was sports. And I am probably the world's <laughs> worst sports <laughs> person. I have never ever been any good at sports. So this was this was great fun. So I was so delighted to get the award. It was really great. It was terrific to, to get it. And um, such an affirmation. Oh yeah. After, After all those years. Yeah. And I had to get up on this stage in front of all of these wonderful broadcasters from all over the world, from BBC, RT, um, all the American stations, Canada, Japan, you name it, they were all there. And all um, seasoned journalists, and I stood up on the stage to accept my award. And I said, you know, when I was 18, I was accepted to do journalism. And, and, um, we didn't have the money to send me. And here I am, my first broadcast, standing on the stage, etc. And I got a standing ovation. So it was, it was really, oh, really, what a start. Yeah, it was really nice. So, I, I mean, when Neve told me this, I've got to meet your mother. Uh, yes. I said, I've got to, this is a story that people, they should hear. Yeah. But there's so many women out there. And they've come from a place of hopelessness. No? And it's just, they're stuck. And they need to hear stories like yours to inspire them, to make them feel like I can do this. Absolutely, I can do this. Absolutely. So many people are coming from the, from divorce, from you know, um, lack of education, just name it. Yes. And you know, they just, just can't find their way through. So stories like yours, absolutely, they just inspire me. They tell me, look, get up and look. I have a dream. I can be that. We're gonna have my share. Uh, creative writing, part of our creative writing club in the last uh, hub one. So Madge, please share that one with us. Positive Deviant. Statistically speaking, you are meant to be in prison or homeless or unemployed. Statistically speaking, you should be living on welfare with numerous children by numerous different women and men. Statistically speaking, you ought to be smoking, drinking, using drugs. How dare you defy statistics mm -hmm. by being well-rounded, tax-paying, law-abiding, sober adults with careers and third-level educations, non-religious in a religious environment, socialists in a world of capitalists, humanists in a world of instant gratification. I am so proud of you, each of you, and to think. There once was a time when I thought that murder-suicide was the only way out. It was a way out, but not a way through. I want you to know that I am still here still here, even though you raped me over and over again when I was eight years old and again in my teens. I am still here, even though you hit me and kicked me and punched me and cut me after you had promised in front of witnesses to love and cherish me. There were no witnesses to my pain. I am still here, even though you left me homeless and penniless with three babies and a head full of guilt and shame and confusion. I am still here and I intend to be here for a long time yet because I refuse to be a statistic. I am a positive deviant, the great grandmother great and grand and a 